Donald Trump doesn't have a philosophy. Donald Trump does, doesn't, he's like a giant id. He's just like me, 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 you know, women, food, diet, Coke, whatever it is. It's just like, you know, come give me more of it. Yeah. Seven deadly sins in a person. Yeah. And welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's pod is a candid conversation with David Rothkop. David is the CEO of the Rothkop Group, a best selling author and journalist, and host of the Deep State Radio podcast. His most recent book, out November 1st, American Resistance The Inside Story of How the Deep State Saved the Nation, is the story of what we're seeing unfold today in the 1 6 hearings. How it could have been so much worse that there were enough people who took their oath to the Constitution seriously to resist the tyrant we had put in charge. David knows politics intimately serving as Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade Policy in the Clinton administration, but also has a grand sense of where America fits into the world, having taught international affairs at Columbia University, Georgetown, and John Hopkins. He is a contributing columnist to the Daily Beast and a member of the Board of Contributors of USA Today. He's authored hundreds of articles for multiple publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Financial Times, and the Daily Beast. He has a great TED Talk and is a regular commentator on pretty much all broadcast media. The man's a real slouch. He should get a job. I'm having him on today because he's a genius, but also because he has an innate ability to tie things together, to craft a narrative that includes current events, history, and big picture concepts that we often overlook. Today, we're going to talk about America, where we are, where we're going, and the danger of living in a country without a democracy. So without further ado, please welcome author, speaker, international expert, and modern day philosopher, unafraid to ask the hard questions, David Rothkop. Welcome, David. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm thrilled. I've been following your work for years and I was so looking forward to having a conversation with you because I think your mind is incredible, but it's your ability to see current events, not just as standalone issues, but as part of a bigger narrative that I find really inspiring. Now, we are right now smack dab in the middle of the 1-6 hearings, which to anyone watching, and I hope everyone is watching and encouraging their people to watch, is an absolutely damning story of an American president who attempted to hold on to power after he'd lost it, and how he and his enablers engaged in this treacherous behavior to usurp the will of the people and overthrow American democracy to benefit themselves. And now this coup attempt is clearly ongoing. As Republican and lifelong conservative judge Michael Luddig said in his testimony, Donald Trump and his allies and supporters are a clear and present danger to the American democracy. Now, the United States is clearly in trouble. So where do you see us at this moment in our history? Well, I, I see us at a crossroads. There is a real possibility, one that I, I frankly never thought I would see in my life, that we could stop being a democracy in the United States. You know, we're focused on the January 6th hearings as we should be, and I think they've done a remarkable job so far of telling this story in a very straightforward way that doesn't sort of minimize the shock of what happened. But, you know, depending what happens in the election in November, depending what happens in the election in November 2024, Republicans could put in place senior officials who would make it impossible for there to be a free and fair election in the United States. In other words, what they want to do is not just repeat the big lie over and over again. They want to repeat the ability to do what Trump wanted to do as the coup over and over again. They want to disenfranchise the American people. And so holding Trump accountable is super important. But defeating secretaries of state who are right-wing big lie advocates in state after state is in some ways even more important because we've relied on the, on the goodwill, the fairness, the professionalism of senior officials. And we've relied on the fact that the courts would uphold what was right, uphold the constitution for 240 years. We may not be able to rely on it going forward. No, it's true. And democracy only works if we all accept the results. You know, 
if we decide that that's not what we're going to do and we're only going to accept the results we like, then we cease to be a democracy. Should I do it? How do we move forward if one third of the country or one third of the electorate is convinced that the president isn't the president and that they've been cheated? You know, my hope is, is that these committee hearings can start changing the narrative and then the actions or the hopeful actions of the DOJ following up and holding these people involved accountable will start to move the needle of public opinion. But how do we counter this kind of witch hunt, corrupt DOJ, deep state story that these people are sold on a daily basis by their leaders and by right wing propaganda machines like Fox News? Well, we vote. We show up to vote. We help others show up to vote. We donate money for candidates that we like. We volunteer for the candidates. And we recognize that the core point you just made is that only a third of Americans believe in this noxious right-wing cocktail of lies. You know, and, and, and the majority of Americans don't. There was a morning consult poll that was, came out a couple of days ago that essentially said two-thirds of Americans think that people who try to steal the election ought to go to jail. Uh, Half of the Republicans who were polled agreed that. So, you know, Donald Trump ran for president twice. He lost the popular vote both times. Uh, And right now, if you look at the candidates for key Senate gubernatorial jobs, the Republicans, because of the influence of the hard right, to put up some really terrible candidates. And in places where they should be leading handily in the polls, they're not. And in some of those places, Democrats are winning. And there's a very real possibility that Democrats could actually increase their majority in the Senate, which is absolutely crucial. If we were to lose both houses, and by we, by the way, I, I'm a Democrat, but when I say we, I mean Americans who believe in democracy. But if we were to be- lose both houses of the Congress, then we speed down the slippery slope towards authoritarianism. But, but if we can rebuff these attempts and show, and this is really the critical thing, show that the big lie, Trumpism, hate-driven philosophy is a political loser, then people will try a different philosophy because politicians act in their self-interest. Nobody has, you know, nobody grew up reading, you know, the Trumpian manifesto, you know. People grew up and they said, I want to be a senator. And then they thought, well, what do I got to do to be a senator right now? And in this weird time in which we live, a lot of them thought, well, I got to sound like Donald Trump. I got to lie. I got to say awful things. Um, I got to be mean to immigrants. I have to be a racist. I've got to be a misogynist. I've got to pare away the rights of voters and, you know, women to control their bodies. Well, if that doesn't work politically, what's going to happen is they're going to change their tune. Do you think the Republicans just don't see the bigger picture? Like, if they're willing to just change their values to get elected, do they just not see the things like they can't see the climate catastrophe coming or they don't see how chaotic the world would become if American democracy fails or they don't see what will happen if this race war they keep pushing actually goes through or the damage would be done with this many guns if they were turned against each other. Um, Are they that insulated that they don't think that these behaviors that they're putting out now overturning elections that they know are fair, that kind of thing. Do they think it's not going to affect them? Because I often think these days of that movie Elysium with Matt Damon. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but um, where it's these super rich elites that are kind of living in a floating paradise without sickness or disease or violence or want. And the rest of the people are just here on earth fighting it out for what we have left in, in a planet that we basically destroyed. And every time I hear about people colonizing Mars or I watch Republican politicians completely abandoning everything they claim to stand for to make sure they get to retain their power, I think, what do they know that I don't know? You know, how can they not see what's coming and how can they be a part of it and not feel like, oh, I'm setting us on a terrible path? Is there a spaceship I don't know about, David? Is there a colony we don't know about? No, I think we know the colony. 
you know, I'm just a guy from New Jersey. I went to public school and live a normal kind of life, right? But, you know, I've been fortunate enough to end up in, you know, kind of privileged places. Right now, I'm talking to you. I'm in the Hamptons. If you walk down the street of the Hamptons, it's not the United States that most people see. If you drive down these right. long avenues of $20 million homes, uh, it's not the United States people want you to see. And uh, when you look at who is donating to the Republican Party, you know, look at Elon Musk the other day saying he's going to support Ron DeSantis. If you really want to shrivel your innards, you know, think about that a little bit. <laughs> why, why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because the elites that are funding this have been promoting a philosophy of small government, not because they really don't like big government. It's because they don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to be regulated. They want to keep more of their money. And what's happened since that philosophy was, you know, really started to gain traction in the 80s during the Reagan administration, 40 years. Over those 40 years, inequality has grown in the United States. Inequality is now worse than it's ever been. If you're born in the bottom fifth, you have less of a chance to get up into the middle than you ever had before in the United States. Um, the rich are getting much richer. Two families control the equivalent of uh, the wealth that is held by the bottom 40% of the population. And, you know, these are the people who are underwriting all of this. And I don't, I don't want to talk about class war, but these people are very, very cynically saying, how do we get enough votes to ensure that we always get the outcome we want when it comes? And, and look, look, look what happened when the Republicans controlled the presidency in the House and Senate. They passed a, quote, relief bill in which 90 percent of the benefits went to the top 10 percent of the population. And, you know, one of the things that I think about is the, the, the fact that the majority of people who empowered them to do that are suckers. They're people who are being played by this. And these people have calculated that those people, that, 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 that bulk of the Republican Party, that's fueling the inequality, but not benefiting from the inequality. Those people are afraid of what the changes that are coming in the U.S. are. They're afraid that by 2043, the majority of people in the United States will be groups we once classified as minorities. They think the world that they were in uh, is not going to continue. And, and these elites are paying politicians to pander to the fears of those people and say, they're going to take away your guns. They're going to, they're going to change your lifestyle. They don't believe in the same God that you believe in. Not because they actually believe those things, but because it suits them. It's like saying, I'm selling this food product and it has no calories and it tastes delicious. And, you know, it, I'm not going to tell you that it's actually going to kill you and shorten your life. Um, I, I'm just going to sell it in the way that I think it's going to be sellable. And, and that's, that's the problem that we've got. The people who are funding this, they don't believe the slogans that are fueling this. Now, does that mean they, you know, they, there aren't ideological differences on, 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 on things like the role of government or abortion or other? No, there's some ideological differences that are residual, but that's not what's driving Trumpism. Donald Trump doesn't have a philosophy. Donald Trump does, doesn't, his brain doesn't work. I don't know if his brain works. He's like a giant id. He's just like me, 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 you know, women, food, diet, coke, whatever it is. It's just like, you know, come give me more of it. Yeah. And, and, um, seven deadly sins in a person. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, it's his, his movement's not philosophical. It's exploitive. And, you know, he's like going out to the farmers saying, oh, I really care about farmers. And then he's flying back to Mar-a-Lago. And, you know, he's living on Elysium, right? He's living on a different planet. Wilbur Ross, you know, his secretary of commerce walking through there, you know, billionaire in his velvet slippers. He doesn't care about those guys in the red hats. 
you know, Steve Mnuchin's wife with the long white gloves, she doesn't care about the, 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 the people in the red hats or the little churches or, or, or frankly, you know, gun rights or any of that other stuff. They just want to keep as much as they can keep. Well, you did an entire TED Talk on how fear drives American politics and how we focused as a nation for a decade on terrorism to the expense of the other trends that were shaping our world, like tech or demographic changes or environmental changes, or about how the people in the world interact with each other. You argue that we need to do a better job of bringing politicians together, again, with people who understand science and technology and And we're in this weird moment in our country's history where science and technology, which were these great things that drove the American uh, vision in the past, are now at war with each other. And I always think that's really interesting that they, you know, we're here with the internet where things are completely changing. And instead of bringing us together, it's tearing us apart. Well, yeah. I mean, look, you know, Thomas Jefferson you know, sat at Monticello and wasn't an inventor and tried to grow new plants and believed in science. Benjamin Franklin believed it. You know, I mean, they lived in the Enlightenment. We were founded by people who, you know, believed by and large in some of these these big ideas. And throughout our history, we've benefited from that. Uh, but we have a government of lawyers. You know, we have a government in which there are almost no people who understand the big trends that are changing our lives, whether it's global warming or whether it's cyber warfare or it's something on the horizon like AI and how AI is going to change your life or big data or how privacy is changing your life or, you know, what it means that the little camera on your computer can be turned on and watch you at all hours of the day and night and what it means that different co- countries have different rules. And, and you know, those different countries are taking a different approach. In China, uh, most of the people who reach high office were trained as engineers. They weren't trained as lawyers. They have a different understanding of this. In Europe, there's a different understanding of this. And we are falling behind. What's more, the response of half of the electorate, of the, half the political establishment, the Republican half, is not to say we need to understand it. It's we need to reject it. Yeah. You know, there is no climate crisis. We're not going to teach science in our schools. Evolution isn't real. That doesn't mean that, you know, evolution isn't real. It means that they're just not going to teach it. And they're, they're, they are selling ignorance. They are, they are tapping into the deep desire of Americans for somebody offering, you know, a, a an approach to the world that doesn't require that they read a lot, that, that doesn't require that they learn anything. You know, they talk about the deep state, but what Trump was selling was the shallow state. You know, he was selling, he was selling, you know, you could be just as stupid as you want. In fact, we're going to enforce stupidity. And look at what Governor Abbott is doing in Texas or look at what Governor DeSantis is doing or what they're doing in, you know, in Kansas and other places where they're burning books. They're outlawing the teaching of history. In Florida, they banned math books because they didn't like the way the problems were worded. And, <laughs> and so, you know, this is a stupid revolution and they're selling stupid because it's comfortable and and mm-hmm. and it's easy and it's you know intellectual fast food and you know Americans can glom it up and th- why are they doing it because that helps them get the number of votes they need to advance their real agenda yeah because people don't want to have to use critical thought. It's very exhausting. It takes a lot of time to have to read the newspapers and read, watch the news. And most people don't have the time. I mean, we've created a society in which people are working their faces off. So they don't really have a lot of extra time anyway. And this concept of Donald Trump saying out loud, I love the uneducated, is, is almost chilling because it's just easier to control Um, people when they don't know what's going on and they're not paying attention. I always say the only people that don't want us paying attention to politics are the people in charge, because if we're not voting and we're not paying attention, then they have all the control to do whatever they want, which is what led us to this moment. 
But no, that's exactly right. My wife has a theory, and that is that, you know, as long as the Kardashians are on television, Donald Trump will be in power. <laughs> I totally agree with your wife. We need way less Kardashians and way more Klobuchar's. That would be a hell of a start. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so long as people are watching reality TV, as so long as they're celebrating people who don't actually know anything, don't actually achieve anything, you know, meaningful in life, you know, are totally driven by the sort of shallowest basis impulses that exist, you know, then, th then that's going to be the ideal in people's minds. And yeah, yeah, I know where there are a couple of billionaire Kardashians, but there are a lot of billionaires who uh, got rich, not because they were selling something virtuous. And I would go back to your other point, by the way, you know, I was in the Clinton administration, and we thought that the internet revolution was going to be the salvation, and that the internet was going to be this great democratizing force, and that the tech elites who were then sort of younger, they were going to be different. And you know what? They're not. They all turned out to be, or many of them turned out to be kind of robber barons, just like past elites. And whether it's Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, Elon Musk or Larry Ellison, or, you know, I mean, we can go down the, the list. A lot of them are right wing. A lot of them are, you know, all about not being regulated, not being taxed, not paying their fair share uh, and having disproportionate power. And, you know, I, th I think I did a thing with a couple month or two ago where I sort of looked at the 10 richest people in the United States and, and six of them controlled major media outlets. So, I mean, in other words, you, you talk about a free, free press, but one of the things you get when you have $100 billion is you get to decide whether you want to own the Washington Post or Amazon or Facebook or Bloomberg or, or, or whatever. Uh, and, and if you think that that's ultimately going to lead to a fair and equitable, you know, political discussion, uh, then they're going to sell you some more nonsense because you know, it, it just it can't it can't happen that way. Yeah, no, it is a lot like the robber baron age. You note that Putin is talking about bringing back the glory days of the USSR, or he wants to be Peter the Great. And Republicans clearly are looking to a world that is more like pre-civil rights 1950s America, or even pre-New Deal 1930s America. You know, this time where a certain group of people was at the top, and the rest of us took what we can get, you know? And then you look at our tech billionaires, and they're kind of those people. They're the the robber baron age type people, the ones that have control over everything. And we've let this entirely innovative uh, technology that controls every part of our lives to be controlled by the smallest group of, you know, creepy people in the most, for the most part. And our government, who's supposed to be regulating them for the good of society, clearly doesn't even understand <laughs> what they're regulating. I mean, I remember watching those hearings around Facebook last year, and they were embarrassing, the things that the lawmakers were asking of these tech giants. Clearly, our lawmakers are quite hopelessly out of depth with what's going well, on in the world. Don't, they, don't they don't know. They don't, they don't know what they don't know. They, they, they right? don't. You know, I, I call it, maybe this dates me a bit, but I call it TV repairman syndrome, which was you used to, if the TV stopped working, you bring the TV to the TV repairman and you said, my TV is not working. And the guy goes, oh, well, I got to do X, Y, and Z. You don't know. You have no idea what's inside your TV, how it works. So you just say, how much is that going to cost me? But for a lot of people, this is the way they handle their cars. But, you know, the, 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 the tech people, you know, how many people do you think on Capitol Hill understand artificial intelligence, cyber war, biotech? Um, you know, you could put them in a phone booth if there were still phone booths, right? And, 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 and this is, this is our problem because it's almost impossible to elect officials who are intellectually engaged enough to stay up to date on the, the, the issues of the moment. And so we're constantly catching up. Yeah. I mean, we're living through this time of profound change, and yet we have these leaders that seem to be clinging to an ideal of how society is supposed to work, and it feels played out. 
antiquated at best. No, it, it doesn't, you know, and, and, and they're selling it because that makes people more comfortable. You know, I mean, it, you know, I, I always remember, you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, to use another one of these kind of analogies. You, you ever notice how sort of women in their 70s have the same hairstyle they had when they were in their 20s? Because <laughs> they, they, they kind of get used to it and they just stick with it because change is uncomfortable for people. And the more change there is, the less comfortable people are with it. And I would say, and I, you know, I'm a Democrat and I don't say a lot of bad stuff about the Biden administration because A, I think on a wide variety of issues, they're doing a pretty good job. Uh, but B, I think we're facing existential elections in November and in 2024. And we just can't afford to sort of snipe at each other within this movement to protect democracy because there's just a, there's a bigger issue there. Yeah. But, but I, I wouldn't say that the Democratic Party and the leadership of the Democratic Party comes across as fresh and young and full of new ideas either, right? And that's a problem. That's a pro it's a problem when the big innovative thought that comes through the Democratic Party is, hey, let's do the New Deal. The New Deal was started almost 100 years ago. I love the impulse of the New Deal. I think the New Deal did a lot of good. I love the idea of improving our sort of uh, uh, social services and catching up in all the areas that we're behind as a country, the only OECD country that doesn't offer health care as a right, the only OECD country that doesn't provide mothers with the chance to, uh, you know, ha or fathers for that matter, to have, um, you know, child leave. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the outlier on a lot of things. And I, I think that change in those areas is needed, but we got to keep our eye on these other big issues. We got, we got to keep our eye on the, the other ways society is changing because among other things, there may be solutions there. There, there may be solutions yeah. in new technology. You know, everybody walks around now with a watch that could tell their doctor exactly what their vital signs are. People would be more comfortable with that if their privacy was protected. Everybody, you know, people might be healthier. Healthcare might cost less. I'm just picking that as one example. Why not, you know, explore those things? Well, the people who are supposed to be thinking about that stuff don't know about it, right? They don't understand it. Yeah, it's all a bit of a mess, right? Let's take a quick break. We'll just absorb it, and we will thank the people who made this episode possible, and we'll be right back after this with David Rothkopf. Are you working too much? Don't take enough time for yourself? Have you ever felt burnt out? I have. In fact, I feel burnt out all the time. I run my own company and when you run your own company, you're never off work. There's no weekend. There's no going home at the end of the day. It's always with you. Even when you take a break, you're not really relaxing because you feel like you should be working. And you don't need to run your own company to feel like this, to work yourself to the bone and not prioritize yourself. Well, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to do just that, to give yourself someone to talk to, to help figure out what's causing you stress, to help you better manage your time and to better manage your emotions. Most of us feel overwhelmed. Many people are burnt out without even knowing it and it presents as lack of motivation or irritability or exhaustion. I don't know what I would do without my therapist to talk to once a week about everything that's stuck in my head. If you think you could benefit, and I'm telling you you can, in having someone to talk to about what is stuck in your head, look into BetterHelp. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and live chat sessions. It's more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Politics Girl listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash politicsgirl. That's better, H-E-L-P, dot com slash politics girl. I promise you won't regret it. The Politics Girl podcast is sponsored by Constant Contact. Constant Contact is a digital marketing platform that helps small businesses and nonprofits of all sizes build, grow and succeed. As I was filling out my son's camp forms this week, I got to the bottom and lo and behold, there was the Constant Contact logo. That's the thing. With email marketing, contact management, social media ads, and more, people are loving this product. 
Constant Contact helps small businesses and not-for-profits connect with customers, find new ones, and sell online, all from one easy-to-use platform. Trusted by millions of businesses to help improve their marketing with a 97% deliverability rate, you will know that your customers and potential customers will be getting the right message at the right time every time. Constant Contact's easy-to-use platform makes contact management easier than ever, and their growth tools will help you find a bigger audience fast. To learn more or start a free trial, go to constantcontact.com. That's constantcontact.com. You guys, I can't tell you how much I love Calm. And I'm not talking about the emotion, which I have very little experience with, but the app in which I have tons of experience with. If you listen to this podcast, then you know I go to sleep every night to a Calm sleep story. I also use the Calm nap meditations to get a quick 28-minute nap to rest and rejuvenate so I can get back to work. I do their meditations for headaches, for pain, for positivity, and I absolutely love the teachers they have and the programs they offer. I'm talking to you about this app because I truly believe in it. If you are ready to stress less, sleep more, and live healthier, join the over 100 million people using Calm around the world. Just go to calm.com slash politicsgirl and you'll get a special offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription. That's 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm dot com slash politics girl. I'm not steering you wrong. This is a fantastic product. Well, that's the thing. I mean, one of the books you wrote that really resonated with me was a book from 2017 that you did with Ted, um, which was called The Great Questions of Tomorrow. And the central idea of that book is we're currently living through this moment in time where the very fabric of our society is being rewoven. We're doing it differently now, but we're not focusing on the right questions to truly navigate this change properly. Um, do you want to walk me through those ideas? about asking the right questions? Well, I think that the core idea, you know, is asking the right questions. I once had a consulting company and we did a lot of work in the sort of area of how to use new tech to answer questions. And a lot of our clients were in the government, some were in corporations. Um, and I thought I was really smart. I was quickly disabused of this notion, but I thought I was really smart because I thought, well, we can use all this technology to answer any question that people had, right? Yeah, this was kind of right before Google, but it was it was like we, we can use all these open sources to answer any question. And what I discovered was that was the answers aren't the problem. It's asking the right questions. It's asking what sh it's not asking how do we fix our broken society. It's asking what should our society look like. It's not how do you fix the problem of tomorrow. It's how do the changes that are happening right now alter that problem into the problem of, did I say the problem of tomorrow, tomorrow, the problem of yesterday, but how do they alter that into the problem of tomorrow? And it's very, very hard to ask the right question. And, and that's what I was trying to, to focus on in the book. And, you know, I mean, we see it every day, you know, look at the war in Ukraine. People thought that this war was going to play out in a certain way because of the way wars were conducted in the past. And all of a sudden, they found that providing a defensive army with new kinds of technologies worked. And all of a sudden, they found that all the assumptions they made about the Russian army were wrong. And they discovered that maybe the cyber threat that Russia posed was less than we thought because the cyber defenses that we could help Ukraine with were stronger than we thought. And, and, and the, so the paradigm was completely different. And, you know, they just yesterday, I think they discovered some Russian documents that showed that the Russian plan had them seizing Kiev in 12 hours. And, you know, we're in, you know, the, you know, day a hundred and whatever it is of this conflict, which is going to go on for a long time. And, and, and the one thing we know is that almost all the assumptions we had going in were wrong. Yeah. I think all the assumptions we have for a lot of things are wrong. You know, we, we found ourselves in a place in Washington for sure that it's completely dysfunctional. Um, you've called it a food fight where we've turned regular discourse into basically a cage match. Um, and this dysfunction has made it 
impossible to get anything done. Like here we are in the richest country in the world and it's far more dangerous that we can't function and get things passed or get things accomplished or come up with big ideas anymore because everything is essentially stopped in its tracks by the system itself. So we can no longer offer bold ideas or new ideas um, because the way the system is set up, anyone who comes up with some creative or exciting new idea won't get confirmed to a government job. They won't get the funding of the big party. This It's kind of this reactive us versus them country we've created, right? What do you think about that? It, it's absolutely the case. You know, uh, we, we have these two media uh ecosystems, which I sometimes call ecosystems because, you know, they, they, people say the same thing over and over. They become giant echo chambers in which the, the world is being portrayed in completely different ways. So if you listen to Tucker Carlson's version of the world, and, and millions of people do, it's not the vision of the world that you might get from reading the New York Times or, for that matter, looking out your window, right? Because it's not real. Um, but there are millions and millions of people um, who get that information from there or from Facebook. I think 70 percent of people get m most of their information from social media. And, you know, who's the editor on social media? The editor on social media is your friend. It's somebody who's forwards something to you or who likes something and, or, you, you know, that you follow because they're your friends. And why do they pick things? Because they think that they, they want to make you stay their friend. You know, there's this social element to it. It's not an editor saying you need to know this. It's someone else saying, here's something that'll make us feel good about ourselves. And so it builds this divide that exists um, between these two, uh, you know, ecosystems. And the politicians play to that. But there stops, you know, it's very hard to find common ground uh, between those two systems. And, and as I, you know, you say cage match, I think that, you know, in some respects, the model for political television has become ESPN. You know, it's, it's, there's a winner and there's a loser. It's sports. You know, you, you, you know, you're active and very successful on, on, on social media and Twitter and so forth. And, you know, it's one side against the other and it's who can get in a good zinger and it's, who can, you know, get the best reaction cheering from the crowd they're playing to? And it's not what's the solution we need. It's not what's a new idea. And that's, I worry as much about the collapse of the skill sets you need to conduct civil society as much as I worry about the collapse of democracy. Yeah. Nobody, you know, kids aren't taught civics. They don't know how government works. They don't, you know, they, they don't, they don't know how to read a map and they get to go to school and then people in, the, in, a, in an American school, they'll say, oh, calculus is too hard for you. Poor pumpkin. You just don't have talent for calculus. So why don't you go and take a class in basket weaving? And, you know, in other countries, it's like, you will learn calculus. My, my dad was a scientist at Bell Labs, and he studied how people learn. And he used to always say that in the United States, if you ask somebody why they do well at math, people say talent. And in Japan or China, if you ask somebody why they do well at math, they say hard work. And it's, you know, that's a fundamental philosophical difference. You know, it's it's compounded by the fact that we have evolved as a society into a, really a kind of philosophical mess. You know, I'm sure you're growing up is the same as my growing up. I grew up and I was like, America is the greatest country in the world and we're the leader. And yeah, we got flaws and I, you know, but but we're a democracy and 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 we understand these issues. And now I look at the world. We're not so much of a democracy. We're falling behind on these critical issues. And there's some people, there's some places that simply get it better. If you live in Holland and you get sick, somebody's going to take care of you. Uh, if you, you know, break a law and go to prison, somebody's going to try to fix what's broke so that you don't do it again. Uh, if you, you know, and, and I always give this example, and we always think we're big capitalists, but when 
uh, the car companies fell on hard times. We had to bail out GM because we didn't have a social safety net. In Sweden, Saab went bankrupt and, 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 and they were allowed to go bankrupt because they knew that everybody would be taken care of. So which is a more capitalist country? Right. The one that actually lets, you know, Saab go bankrupt or the one that had to prop up GM because we we're afraid of the unemployment? You know, and, and if you look at these countries, by the way, and I'm not selling Northern European capitalism, but if you, if you look at these countries, <laughs> they have balanced, they have balanced budgets. If you look at these countries, you know, look at who's supporting Ukraine right now more, most vigorously, the Baltics, Northern Europeans, um, you know, and, and I, I just, I, I think it would be really good for Americans if we have a little humility. And we ask ourselves, what can we learn from what works elsewhere in the world and and try to embrace that here, even as we keep what we like that about America that makes us especially yeah. American? Well, I mean, it's like the AA saying, you know, the first step is admitting you have a problem. And I think that's what America needs to do. It needs to admit it has a problem, first of all. Now, when you said you grew up probably thinking America was the greatest country in the world, I grew up in Canada. I thought I lived next door to the greatest country in the world, but I didn't think they were the greatest country in the world because I loved where I lived. I thought it was a marvelous place to grow up. I chose America as an immigrant, which often makes me uh, look at it a little bit differently. But I was listening to a, uh, a TikTok the other day of a girl from the UK, and she was posing the question, is it still fair to make fun of Americans? And she said, we've been making fun of Americans for so long because they were always this big top dog. You know, they, they looked great. They were rich. They had everything. They were the greatest nation in the world. And so making fun of Americans was easy because we were punching up. We didn't feel bad. And she said, now I look at America and unless you're one of the richest people there, you know, I feel like if making fun of them is punching down, she said, I don't worry when my kids go to school that they might not come home because they were shot to death. I don't worry if I'm in a car accident that I'm going to go bankrupt to pay for it to take care of myself. I don't worry that I'm going to run out of food or lose my job and then not be able to stay in my home. These are things that are, I'm, are taken care of here in my country, but Americans don't have that. And she said, I feel like we should look at them like we would look at any failing nation. And I felt like, oh, <laughs> like they, she's just like, I just don't think we should make fun of Americans anymore. And I thought, oh my God, that seems so incredibly valid, right? You were talking about Facebook and how, who's the editor of Facebook? Your friend. I think the editor of Facebook is an algorithm that hits us up with whatever will keep us most engaged, keep us on their platform. And we've heard that. We know that that's what they're doing, which is goes back to what we were talking about, about how these tech billionaires are don't want any government control. There's no looking ahead to solve any problems. They're not saying, well, here's an issue and we're going to solve it. And the government says, if you don't solve it, we're going to make you solve it. We don't do that anymore. So everything we do is reactionary. And we're not looking ahead at the problems that are coming at us. Even though I think it's very important that we are looking at the big problems facing the country and we're looking at a sitting president that tried to overthrow democracy and one of our two major parties that's on board for overthrowing um, democracy. But then we have to look at the 3,000 cows that just died in Kansas of heat stroke, right? Like, that's the future if we don't start dealing with it and we just don't start, as you say, thinking about the big questions like, what is our society for? What is our government for? What are we doing here if we have all of our livestock dying in Kansas? What's it going to be like living in India if it's that hot in Kansas? You know, then you're looking at mass migrations and you're looking at food shortages and water shortages. These are forward thinking questions we have to get our head around. And I think that if we're all mired in the day to day, how am I feeling today? Let's talk about Dr. Seuss and Mr. Potato Head and, you know, this kind of stuff. We're never solving the big questions. And if we're going to use big ideas and, and, and big thoughts, we're going to have to, like you said, put more people in office that want to answer those questions and potentially younger people of this era that are willing to look at these problems as something that can be solved and not something that should be ignored. By all means, younger people, by all means, people who understand these problems, you know, younger people. That's not they, ageism either, because clearly. I don't care if it is ageism. The, re the reality is that if you've got a longer stake 
in the country, you're going to approach it in a different way. Younger people believe that the climate crisis is existential. You know, they, they, they don't have to be persuaded of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there are real advantages to, to that. They're also more fluent in a lot of the technologies that we're talking about. But having, having said that, you know, I, 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 th- I think you're, you know, right to question the United States. And I think one of the problems that has evolved is we've taken certain ideas to their illogical extreme, you know, small government, government, government is the enemy. Well, if government is the enemy, how are you going to solve the problems that we, that we face? Sometimes society, you know, that's why governments were created. It helps us defend ourselves. It helps us solve social problems that, you know, might be a disease or it might be, um, um, you know, having a fire department or it might be having schools, you know, and we can't make those mechanisms the enemy. And yet there's a big portion in your society that does that. At the same token, you know, Anglo-American capitalism is all about the individual. It's not about the community. Other societies are more, you know, they have, they found a different balance. It's not, you know, it's not Chinese communism where the individual means nothing, but they find more of a balance. And I, you know, when you were growing up in Canada, you may not have fully appreciated how good you had it because the balance in Canada is is pretty darn good when it comes to these issues. And yeah. Canada feels like America. It feels free. You get to do what you want. You can be an entrepreneur. But, you know, the leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States, as you pointed out, is disease, healthcare. You know, it's it's it, the main reason people medical go debt, yeah. is that medical debt, they can't deal with it. So that's not the case there. That the big shootings don't take place there. Um, there's more of an awareness on issues like um, uh, uh, global warming. And there's also a degree more humility, like let's find ways to work with the rest of the world. Let's learn from the rest of the world. Now, look, I'm not saying, you know, Canada's, you know, perfect. It's not. Whereas Labatt's beer is not the best beer, right? But, but, um, but, but, you know, the, 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 you know the, the, having said that, there's a lot we could learn from Canada and there's a lot we could learn from these other countries. Now, when I hear you say, well, there's some British woman and she's like, you know, I feel sorry for the U.S. I don't want to look down on it. Well, have you looked at Boris Johnson? Have you looked at your immigration? Policies? <laughs> have you looked at the fact that, you know, uh, you know, Scotland and Wales want to leave? You know, have you, you know, that, you know, that, have you looked at the incredible catastrophe of Brexit? You know, I mean, you know, the, 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 the yes, I'm, but you get her point. You get yeah, her point no, no, that, that America is no longer you know, this the, shining star that gets to be number one in the whole world and nor probably should they ever have been. You know, if your child is the best looking, most handsome, richest kid in school, the last thing he should do is go to school and tell everyone he's the best looking, most handsome, richest kid. You have to be like, shh, you don't say that. You look out for the little guy because you happen to have those wonderful qualities. America hasn't been very good at. Uh, being strong without pointing out to everyone how strong it is. It's a bit exhausting. That's absolutely right. And I think, I think the, the, the reality is that, you know, great athletes keep setting higher standards and keep pushing themselves and keep trying to get better and better. They don't say, oh, I won the championship last year. It's over, you know? And, and I, you're, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. And if they want a lasting career, then they also have to be a nice guy because those are the guys that get the commentary jobs after their knees blow out. You know, you have to be a good person in the world as well if you want your career to continue. Okay. So where do you see us going from here? Not as a country and the crisis of democracy, but as a way to move forward, not looking back, not wanting to return to the past. I, it feels terrifying, but you have also said that fear can be a catalyst to great innovation, right? When we're in these big moments of upheaval, the questions we ask ourselves should be more fundamental. And you've called yourself an optimist. You say you don't believe you can study human history and not be an optimist. Now, I look at human history a little differently and I think, good grief, what's wrong with humans? But tell me why you're optimistic or what you think we can be optimistic about before you go. Okay. Well, I'll take the second half of the question first. I, when I, the reason I say I'm an optimist is because I believe in progress. And, you know, you talk about American history, for example, we say, oh, we've never had it this bad. 
That's just not true. It was always this bad. We had to fight a revolution to get away from the British. We then committed genocide against the Indians and stole all their land. We had slaves for a hundred years. We then had the bloodiest civil war in the bloodiest war in the history of the world at that time. We then had the robber baron era of inequality. That was then followed by, um, you know, entering into the world into bloody world wars where we, you know, lost a lot of lives. There was the Spanish flu, there was racism, there was the yellow barrel, the red barrel, you know, there was the, the, the Great Depression, um, uh, you know, there was McCarthyism, there, you know, it, you know, every, every generation faces its problems. So first of all, you know, and, and, and having said that, we made progress, you know, women got the vote, black people got the vote. Black people, for a while anyway, in our society got voting rights. They're taking that away now, but they had it. Uh, you know, in, in 1900, the average life expectancy of an American male was 46 years old. Uh, if, if I lived in 1900, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation, not just because it wasn't the Internet, but because I'm older than 46 years old. Um, and, you know, the, you know, and no one would let me talk to you. <laughs> and no one, right. You wouldn't be allowed to have a microphone and you would, people would have viewed you as some man's possession. Because until fairly recently, the concept was woman, you know, chattel marriage, right? So, you know, th 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 we have made a lot of progress in the world. There's been scientific medical progress and, and so on and so forth. But there's another reason to be optimistic. Take any issue in the United States, political issue, despite these divisions, that you think is it is an important area for change. And, I, and you and I have never met, never talked to each other, but, but you know, I'm going to guess that you probably think we ought to have gun control, reasonable gun control. You probably think we ought to address the climate. You probably think we ought to have educational reform. You might think we ought to have health care for everybody. You might think we ought to have more investment in R&D and infrastructure, you might, you know, I'm a long list of things, right? Every single one of those issues is supported by two thirds of Americans. So we talk about being a divided country, but there is actually a substantial supermajority in the United States that wants the same reasonable things, all the things that you would have talked about, about what works in Canada, what works in Europe, what could we do better? Most Americans want that. So what we have to do is work on getting our system to be more responsive to the common sense impulses of the vast majority of Americans. And while we're at it, start having enough humility that we learn where we've got to adapt, where we've got to have younger views, more scientifically informed views, more technologically informed views, more globally informed views. And all I'm saying is the arrows of progress are pointing in the right direction. The arrows of public opinion are pointing in the right direction. So, you know, in the long run, and probably after having made a few catastrophic mistakes, I think we'll end up in the right place. Well, if we listen to the two thirds of the country, we sure will, because your point is great. If we aren't a divided country, we're being divided. And we have always continued to make progress. We just have to make sure we don't allow the people that would hold us back to hold us back. And that's on us. That's something we can actually do. But, but, but do you know how you do that? How do you do that? You preserve democracy. Yeah. Democracy gives those two thirds the upper hand. And the reason that the others are opposed to democracy is they know that it kills their deal. If the majority gets their way, they're out of business. And so we've got to fight really yeah. hard because that gets us there. It's why I say everyone should talk about politics. Everyone should talk about politics because the more we talk, the more we understand, and the more we understand, the more we care, and the more we care, the more we vote. And once we're voting, they can't stop us. And I find that exciting. Now, I know you're everywhere. I know you're on TVs, you're on our bookshelves, you're in our newspapers. But if people want to follow your work so they don't miss any of your insight, what's the best way to do that? I, I, you know, I'm on Twitter, DJ Rothkopf at twitter.com. I have a podcast called Deep State Radio. Great podcast. Thank you. We have a dsrnetwork.com. And, you know, we, we do half dozen 
going on going to be 10 podcasts a week soon. Um, so you can go to the DSR network, see what we've got coming. I've got a new book coming out in October called American Resistance, How the Deep State Saved the Country. Um, and it's about how during the worst of the Trump administration, there are a lot of people in the government, including a lot of Republicans. We see this in, in the January 6th commission, who you may not agree with on a lot of things, who actually kept things from getting much worse. And I'm not just talking about the coup. I'm talking about COVID. I'm talking about immigration. I'm talking about wars that didn't get fought because some people, you know, I mean, Trump wanted, you know, it, as bad as you think Trump is, he's worse. You know, he wanted to launch missiles. And Mark Esper's book talks about at, at, at Mexico, at Arab, right? Right. Yeah. Launch missiles at Mexico. And if that didn't work, he wanted to have a moat with alligators in it between us and Mexico. You know, I mean, yeah, it's true. No. Yeah, no, absolutely no. true. In fact, <laughs> he brought up the moat with alligators in it over and over again. And people in his, you know, in the White House would kind of like, okay, boss. And they would figure out a way not to do this. And so the book is about how, you know, sensible people in the U.S. government from both parties and civil servants and foreign service officers and intelligence officers, military officers, kept things from getting much worse. They want to put the alligator moat guy back in charge? Well, they're not going to. I mean, let's be, let's be honest. He's old. <laughs> he's discredited. Worry about Ron DeSantis. Worry about Tom Cotton. Worry about Mike Pompeo. Worry about Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley or Christy Nome or some of these other characters that they've got out there who are just uh, horrible. Oh, no, and I, I should have mentioned, I also write a column every week for the Daily Beast and also uh, every few weeks for USA Today. Yeah, you wrote a, just wrote a recent column for the Daily Beast that was all about how the reports of our demise of American democracy might be premature. I'm looking forward to reading that one. <laughs> yeah, well, again, you know, it was one of those, I'm, I, I was out in the sun, I think, too long. And, but, you know, I was having a little outbreak of optimism. And, oh, gosh. You know, if you, and you wrote it down? Thank you. <laughs> well, but, you know, you look at the January 6th committee and, and it's like they're telling the story. But they're not just telling the story. They're doing it better than any committee of its kind has ever done it. They're, it's edited, it's sound bites, it's clear. There are no weasel words. It's not lawyerly. It's fact, fact, fact. And all the people who are testifying are Republicans. You know, they're not, it's, you know, you talk about bipartisan, but the testimony is all coming from the other side. It's so it's so compelling. And you think, well, that's working. And we may get some gun legislation. And, you know, there, there is some progress being made um, in terms of, you know, polling data that says people actually are paying attention. 20 million people watched the first one of those hearings. So, you know. On, they, you on know, network I, television, way more on online. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'm, you know, it's more than watch the NBA finals. It's more than what well, certainly we're watching Fox or that other name. Fine. In fact, Fox finally came around and they said they're going to televise it. And the Republicans were actually speaking out against Donald Trump. So, you know, I'm not saying our, we're out of the woods. We've got a lot of big problems. But, you know, when, when we have positive signs, let's cling to them. It's, it's summertime after all. Let's, have let's cling to them. You're Absolutely. Right? <laughs> we need to have hot politics summer, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Um, your insight has been amazing. I, I find what you say and what you write just tremendous. And I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and opening minds today. Uh, we might not have all the answers, obviously, but we certainly need to start asking the right questions and and really focusing on the importance of holding up our democracy at this time where it is so fragile. And yet we are so close to so many wonderful things. Thank you so much for joining me today, David. I'm so grateful. It was a real pleasure. And I got to say, congratulations on all you're doing. Congratulations on the impact you're having. It's real, real important that, that you know, voices like yours be heard. And one of the reasons I was so happy to have the chance to be with you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. I think uh, the more people we can get involved in this system, the better. Because the more people that know, the more change we can actually make. Absolutely right. So that was David Rothkopf author, journalist, and political expert, reminding us that the solution to what ails America lies in upholding democracy, that the first step to fixing our problem is admitting we have a problem, and to use that humility to pick the right leaders. 
Leaders who will not only uphold a country by the people for the people, but who will ask the right questions so we can best deal with the problems we face as a nation. We need to get back to a place of innovation, of bold ideas, and of civic knowledge. We need to demand leaders who use their power to fix things, not just have their power to get things. David reminds us that two-thirds of this country want to go in the same direction, so we can't allow the other one-third to drive. We've had terrible moments in the past, and we still made progress. We can't stop now. I would like to thank David Rothkopf for being with us today, and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.